Okay, let's uh, go over the first game in my D&D campaign. Hello and welcome to the Battle in Barrow. Uh, this is going to be the first in a hopefully series of videos where I go over the D&D campaign I'm running. So if you're watching the campaign planning videos, you can probably see all what I share there come to fruition how and find out how it went. So what I'm going to do is just real, sort of go over the uh, last session I, I, I run. That was about a four hour session. So I'm going to try and condense that down into hopefully just over 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. So let's see how it goes. So to begin with, I'm, I'm only running this for two players and they are both new players to D&D. It's uh, so my wife and my friend Rob from RM Project UK. Uh, maybe later on we'll get more players, but for now that's plenty while they're still learning the game. And my intention is maybe get them some uh, NPCs if they need it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, they are a, an elf uh, wizard uh, and a human ranger. Now the nice thing about these classes, they both have the ability to have companions, wizards in familiars and when they get to level 3 rangers in, if they take the beast master route, they can have an animal companion so that might be good as well to explore and I think both of them are interested in that anyway. The game uh, world is set in Mistara, uh, which is a really early D&D setting which Wizards of the Coast seem have seemingly forgotten about that they own. Uh, I did get quite excited when I read through the DM's guide for the first time saw a little paragraph on Mistara, which is great, I thought they'd largely forgotten it. Uh, Mistara is uh, what was in the Beck Me edition of D&D, the world that was created for that, and it's brilliant. It's um, I've covered it before in a video talked about when I've talked about it. It is a campaign setting that is detailed but not over detailed so you can still put your own mark in it, add your own things to it without stepping on any uh, cannon toes as it were. And we are specifically setting our uh, game in Keramikos uh, which is the Grand Duchy of Keramikos. And so what I did, I read a, prepared a bit, and I should point out that uh, all this sort of stuff here, I mentioned this in the planning video, I'm going to make available for my patrons, so they can just download it, um, and I'm going to probably pretty it up, put it into a PDF so it's nice, and maybe if someone, if they want it, and you want it, and you want just the or more raw notes, so it takes less ink to pink print out I'll put that up as well but yeah so I prepared a uh, little blurb about Karamikos just because no one would be aware of it explaining what it is this was largely taken from B11 the uh, King's Festival we then begun the uh, game proper and we start just outside of Threshold in the South Gate um, they when they arrive they're halted by a, a grim gruff looking giant of a man and a female holding a ledger who looks like a scribe. And he is uh, from B11 um, as well. I think he's first defined. He might be in other modules, but that's where I got him from. His name's Sergeant Arfol. Yeah, I don't know if anything went through your mind when I said that, but it sounded a bit, a bit rude. So I actually wrote that in to the campaign. He's got a deep, gruff voice. So he's like... And so when, he, when the players walk up, he's... Welcome to Threshold, I'm Sergeant Arfol. And with that, I have the guards behind him start snickering. Um, kind of like that scene from Life of Brian. And he's then like, yeah, yeah, I know what my name sounds like. And most people around here probably think I am that too. Um, so yeah, what I wanted to come across that he is a bit gruff, but when you get to know him, he's got a heart of gold. Um, I should point out accent-wise, uh, Karamikos, I guess most commoners or locals uh, should be sounding more like Eastern European, Romanian, and most upper class and new people, the Phaeacians, should be sounding, I guess, more Roman. I can't do those accents, so uh, common, I'm going for my local common accent, and for posh, I'm going more Queen's English. So, what happens then is the scribe asks for the players' names, and this is a great point for them to introduce themselves. So, the female magic user elf introduces her name as Witchy Poo. 
Uh, now, the scribe immediately guesses that that's obviously not her real elf name and asks if it's like an affectionate colloquial name that the humans have given her, to which the elf says yes. Uh, does she want to give away her elf name? She denies, but the scribe is happy with that. Now, the ranger is seemingly drunk, and he's so drunk he can't remember his name. Uh, so at the moment he is the ranger with no name. Uh, the Sergeant Arfol looks at them and asks for their weapons to be checked in. So the ranger has to check in his bow, which he does. And then the uh, he also points out that no magic is allowed within the gates. Um, within the city, uh, the town itself. He also mentions that the Hook and Hatchet is a good tavern and he'll be there after shift. I was um, With that, he asked uh, the guard called Boris to guide the players to the town square and lock their weapons up. So they make their way to the town square. Boris goes to the town hall where he puts their weapons. They're now standing outside the town hall and the gold dragon inn. So that's two inns now and they haven't taken the bite of. But what they do notice is the notice board outside the town hall. Uh, which is great because that's what I want them to notice and there are three jobs printed there now these jobs are printed on how I describe different qualities of paper there is uh, some real high quality paper some so-so paper and some really poor almost a scrap of paper jobs now what this equated to is how one how difficult the jobs were so the better quality paper was the more difficult the scrap paper was the easiest and uh, also how much reward was the more difficult the greater the reward so the great uh, high quality job was the old mill which was seeing a merchant over on Fogel Island uh, or Fogel Island and they have to go to the old mill and clear it out of rats and bugs the medium job was a uh, go and see someone in town about a missing child last seen fishing on towards the south of the town and the cheap job was to see Magda in uh, the old part of town and she's got hearing noises in her attic all three of these jobs are uh, from the expert set and I took them from there I was expecting them to take the most well-paid job uh, and then maybe the medium job uh, they did not they went straight to the uh, cheapest job which is to go and see Magda also in town they meet Alina Haralung the uh, Baron's niece uh, from and people who played back me as kids will remember her fondly and so instantly they like her as well which is great they really like her and then they make their way to find out where Magda lives uh, so they had to make some inquiries so they went into the gold dragon and they noticed that inside this it was just full of adventurers uh, maybe they could hire some they didn't take this up uh, they asked about Magda uh, they said no try the uh, juggling ogre in merchant town because that's where she lives near and I wanted to not have prolong it too long about this sort of part of it which they do and they enter the jug juggling ogre uh, where they meet the uh, barman there will and get a bit of a repertoire with him ordering a drink and so forth and they find out that magda lives nearby they inquire about magda who she is and will says she's a sweet old lady um who is rather poor but some people around here don't think she's as poor as she makes out because she's always very generous with her money she's always willing to give it away and help others before she helps herself so they go over to magda's house and outside it is looks so run down it borders on derelict this woman clearly is making if she does have money she's making a good job of showing that she doesn't so they go in uh, they discuss terms and they enter the attic um, they peer through the hatch and there's enough light illuminating through the attic hatch to see into the room and it's full of boxes and storage areas and a door on the other side so they enter uh, the elf listens out at the door and she hears some flapping of noises from the next room the ranger who of course doesn't have his bow remember at this point uh, 
looks through the boxes to see if there is anything of value uh, and there isn't it's just old clothes and furniture so there's no no treasures here um, so they open the door and the ranger opens goes first with the elf standing behind him and they open the door and inside it's just black they can't see much and at this point I should I may do a video about this covering uh, my I'm doing away with dark vision in this they don't have dark vision you go we're having Beck meeting for vision it's similar but not OPP so you still have that darkness you can still get away as a DM of having darkness now Infravision allows people to see objects in pretty much black and white like dark vision but they see uh, heat as such almost uh, so they see cold in blue and hot as red now the ranger with what he can see can just about make out a what looks like someone lying upon the floor in the far corner the elf looks in and can see it too but she sees it as blue so it's obviously not a living thing uh, but what she does look up, do is she looks up and the ceiling is just red. Now between that and the flapping noise and the fact they're in the attic, they, she just thinks there's just bats. And the noise they heard was this person breaking in, having an unfortunate accident and dying. And there's just bats. So the ranger pulls out a torch and lights it so they can see properly. And with that, all heck breaks out um it's not bats it's sturges 30 sturges and as soon as the light comes they're flying everywhere they're flapping everywhere uh the ranger does gets out his sword he doesn't have his bow and the elf readies a spell she's going to cast burning hands where she puts her hands out and does that sort of art of fire uh, because they had already talked about how the rangers knelt, knelt down and that she's standing behind she can do it over his head nice and safely and the way i run this campaign is you're not targeting an individual stir just so many there flapping around and flying around and buzzing around uh the damage you roll for attack as normal and the damage you do is the total amount of hit points you're doing to the total swarm if you like of them so each sturge had two hit points so if you did five uh, points of damage you're going to kill two sturges and wound another one down to half um, so that's the way I've done it so to begin with the elf cast burning hands and she takes out half the sturges in one blow uh, the ranger comes next and takes out two more in a swing of his sword but then the sturges are coming in and they're uh, biting and sucking blood and I thought it being the easy combat I thought this would be quite easy to deal with but by the end of it the ranger is almost dead the sturges have done a number on them but they succeed they then investigate the body in the corner and it's quite clearly when they look at it the body of a thief uh, you can it's got that cloak the cow pick locks and all manner of things like that and also 200 gold coins which is from a uh, previous night's work I guess uh, they hypothesized that he had heard that there is uh, Magda did have money and he was going to find out where she hid it and then come a crop of the Sturges so with that they've made a nice bit of money probably more than the reward of the quest they go and see Magda and the elf decides not to claim the reward she can keep it because she's obviously poor and so I both award them a um, point of inspiration and they leave they then go back to the juggling ogre but the ranger says he needs to do something first now I'm thinking he is going to the chapel so the ranger decides that yes he is going to get healed but beforehand he knocks back on Magda's door and explains that yes well the elf is virtuous he has an employer so I don't know this character this could be a nice character development I didn't query this his employer needs payment for jobs that the ranger undertakes so can he have his half Magda being a sweet kind old lady yep yeah, totally agrees it's, um, it is what it is it was the agreed payments so he pays she pays them half the money which is in copper pieces uh, of course he loses his point of inspiration after that he does go to the chapel to the church and sees Alina who heals him now she heals him for free uh, what she'd said when they first met them is could she she would heal him for free but the payment would be 
hearing about their adventurous exploits because she always wanted to be an adventurer but her duties within the church prevent that from happening so she's going to live vicariously through them so yeah he the ranger regales his recent exploits she's really impressed that he killed all those sturges she heals them and he is actually now getting a bit of a relationship with her he's get a bit of a repertoire with her which is great just what i wanted he then meets back up with the elf and they have a meal and a room for the night and rest up she regains her spells the next day they set out for a, another uh, adventure and this time they pick the river one so they went the opposite way to what i thought they did sometimes the players that will happen in a game I was more prepared to do the handle this the other way around and sometimes players will just throw you a curveball like that. Uh, so yes, they're off to the river. They uh, On the note on the notice board it tell, tells them where to start, which is the house. So they go there, they meet the family who are obviously in great distress. The wife, is it, all she's doing is sobbing. The husband, whilst mild manner, he's just barely holding it together and asking them to find their son. Uh, their son uh, likes fishing and wizards, so he always wears a purple wizard's outfit. Um, and at this point, I should give perhaps a, almost a spoiler warning and a trigger warning for those. When I wrote this, I didn't really think about it, uh, but this does involve a child death. So if you're triggered by such things, skip ahead a wee bit to after the river. Uh, combat and when I wrote this I didn't actually think it would be that horrific and as I went on I realized it was quite horrific so they head towards the river go south through the town where they uh they the ranger picks up his bow on the way through and says hi to Sergeant Arthol uh they go south and the ranger uses his rangery abilities and find some child tracks and he rolls so good as well he also noticed some snake tracks going in the same direction they follow it a bit further on and see a child's purple wizard hat laying on the floor they pick it up and out flops a poisonous snake now in the footage you're seeing the model here is not indicative of the actual size of the snake i just didn't have a it's quite a large snake, but not this large. I didn't have an appropriate model. This would do. This, you know, I might sculpt a snake model in some point in the future, but I don't, probably don't need it now. But this model will do. So they fight it and dispatch it quite easy and carry on south, where they come across the riverbank and there is a tackle box and a fishing rod just lying there. As they get near, they also see two more of these same size poisonous snakes. And once again, the models aren't indicative of the size. They dispatch those, and just as they are going to examine the tackle box, from the river itself bursts a ginormous, gigantic poisonous snake. And the model you are seeing here is indicative of its size. This is how big it is. This is the boss battle. It's exciting. Initiative has been rolled. The ranger unleashes an arrow. It's such a good hit. We decide it goes in the eye and it does pretty much half damage to this snake already. The elf uses a magic, gives it a good burn in with fiery hands again. She's utilizing that and this snake's almost dead already. Uh, the well, best well played plans of your boss battle, eh? Next round, the snake misses, doesn't do anything. Next round, Ranger again unleashes a, another arrow and we decide again, it was such a good roll. It's stuck in the other eye, snake is now dead. What they notice as well is once it's dead, there is a bulge in the snake. And this is your trick or warning apart here. They cut the snake open and out flops the half digested remains of the child. Uh, the elf wraps it up in her robe, a cloak that she's wearing, and they carry it back to town. And also the ranger, for some reason, uh, carries the dead snake back to town. Um, I don't know if he wants to sell the lever or what. Passing through Sergeant Arthol, he suggests that uh, they go up to the Tarn Keep for um, a reward. What they had noticed on the way there, which I forgot to mention, there was another notice on the notice board saying uh, that Bargle has been spotted in the ruins outside town. And so 
there's a job see go see go up to town keep see the baron get the job so with this they've now got two jobs pointing that way so they decide to do that after visiting the boy's family and telling them the sad news um obviously the parents are devastated and he pays double what he said he would offer they then make their way to town keep as they've got two quests that are pointing there now uh, they get there and they're informed that the Baron is not available by the uh, assistant. I can't remember, I didn't have a name for him yet. I will do soon. Flesh him out a bit because he is going to be quite an important character. But they, uh, so they're told, they uh, inform him about the snake and what they did, and he speaks on behalf of the Baron and says he can reward them, so he rewards them as well. Uh, and they inquire about the Bargle job, and he looks a bit flustered at this and sort of says he wished they could have come sooner because in the absence of no one taking up the job Alina taking advantage of the Baron not being available has taken up the job and gone to investigate the ruins uh, with that they go back to town uh, and rest up once more it's the next morning there is another job on the notice board from uh, Clifton Caldwell who uh, they find in the juggling ogre in again uh, they, ch they manage to get terms talk terms and they set off to Castle Caldwell uh, along the way they look north towards the Blackstone Heath and see a large black brick building which they don't investigate at this time because they want to get to the castle. We get to the castle and we're outside the castle and that's where I ended the session. It was a great game. Uh, the sandbox our idea worked really well as and the sort of session zero sandbox worked really well. The players really enjoyed having this freedom of choice where they felt like they were they were the characters in their own story rather than me railroading them into this we're playing this campaign we're playing this adventure so that worked really well it went exactly as i hoped it would everyone had a good time i thought maybe we'd be doing these once a month but apparently we're doing one this weekend so uh we're doing castle Caldwell this weekend um i think i shall leave it there um and i'll hopefully do another report on Caldwell to see how that went uh, if you have any suggestions about things you'd like you'd like to see these how these videos would be done, let me know. But until the next time, guys, stay safe, take care. Cheerio.